Egypt, the land of the pharaohs, one of the greatest civilizations ever known. A new age awaits. As Menepta's final years are upon us, the eyes of the Egyptian court and its people look to the prospective new leaders of their land. These leaders will be the characters you get to command in Total War Pharaoh. But how do the Egyptians play? How will they stem the tide of the Hittites, the Canaanites, and the Sea Peoples, as well as the collapse of the Bronze Age? A quick note before we begin, Total War Pharaoh is currently in development, so things may change between this video and release. The UI colours are also a bit different from usual here, as I've got colourblind options applied to help out, as I don't see some colours all that well. With this quick disclaimer out of the way, let's dive into the Egyptian factions. The prospective pharaohs of Egypt all have their own histories and links to Menepta and the pharaoh's crown. On the border of Canaan in Sinai, we have Ramesses, begotten of the sun god Ra. Ramesses is young, ambitious, and ready to follow the path of greatness shared by his namesake, but Ramesses II. A martial prodigy, Ramesses' youth brings him a speed and capability not shared by other characters. He'll need to utilize both of these in order to deal with the incursions at the Canaan border from the great raider Ursu, whilst being aware of the dark cloud on the horizon. Further along the river in Hardai, Seti, the son of Menepta, skirmishes with the western desert tribes to prove his martial superiority and worthiness for the crown. While he's next in line to the throne by birthright, he would rather prove his worthiness with a display of power, a language he knows better than the parlance of the courts. Tausaret, on the other hand, has a very different approach to power than the other leaders. It's not about god-given rights or grandstanding, but having the keen mind and knowledge you will be a better pharaoh than them. A methodical genius, Tausret's strength lies in her intelligence. She starts in the deserts of Yebu in Upper Egypt. Through synergizing her provinces to bolster her economy, and working alongside Seti and whoever else she can sway to her line of thinking, she can maintain the majesty of this ancient empire. And lastly, down in the south, we have Amun Mess, the Viceroy of Kush. Whilst Amun Mess is the eldest male heir, Seti is the designated heir. As powerful as a title like Viceroy of Kush may be, it's not nearly as powerful or attractive as Pharaoh. Being the Viceroy of Kush does come with its benefits, however. Benefits like control over Egypt's gold mines. Amun Mess knows that the true power over man isn't blood, but money. And he'll use this truth to fight his way back up to Menefer, buying whoever he can to take back what he believes is rightfully his. With our leaders set on the stage, let's take a quick look at what makes them mechanically unique in their grab for power. Each journey to the pharaoh's crown can take a multitude of paths, playing to their individual strengths. Starting with Ramesses, as a militaristic leader, he is an exceptionally capable warrior, efficient with any weapon handed to him. His elite warrior status is something also shared by his armies, as while they are smaller in number, they are stronger and more elite than your average foot soldier. Not only does he wield incredible martial prowess, but he also harbors incredible speed, both on the field and in the courts. Per turn, he gets two court actions, while other leaders only receive one. His unique buildings also factor his standing within the court and amongst his people. The necropolis of the honored dead bolsters happiness and influence within provinces. The wine markets also improve happiness, as one would imagine. The military academy brings out the best in his men, raising recruitment rates and making generals cheaper to recruit. It also fortifies the soldiers with a steady amount of experience, ensuring they do not head into the field greener than their counterparts. Seti, meanwhile, in many ways runs as an opposite to Ramesses. He cares little for the court, and prefers to speak in a language he understands fluently. War. Thankfully for him, he starts with an improved standing with Tausaret, who understands the courts and diplomacy like the back of her hand. His starting army is large, and he begins his journey near all five resource settlement types, meaning he can kickstart his economy quite early provided he removes whoever is controlling those settlements nearby. 
Seti's unique buildings exemplify his love for war, his depiction of ego, and his genuine lack of care for what anyone else thinks. The mustering office increases recruitment slots, as well as decreasing the cost of enlisting troops within a province. The recruitment administration center further drives down recruitment costs, whilst allowing you to train more troops, at the expense of the new enlists' well-being. Meanwhile, the tax administration palace continues its own way of obtaining spoils of war from amongst the populace, increasing production greatly at the cost of workforce growth and happiness. Lastly, the Seti's Royal Palace, showcasing the kind of boisterous nature befitting of a prospective pharaoh of his stature. His troops look on with improved morale, whilst all other factions look upon it as unnecessary grandstanding from a potential tyrant. Talseret, meanwhile, understands the importance of structure and production lines, especially in trying times such as these. She starts with improved diplomatic relations with Seti, meaning she may gain assistance from Seti's forces. Militaristic might isn't Tausret's main strength or plan, however. It's production. While her unique structures may not bring happiness and joy to her people, they are a necessary slight. The provisioning headquarters, Tausret's armory, Tausret's goldsmiths, and the storage center all provide their own powerful buffs, but they really begin to shine when you plan out your construction. Her machinations can be fragile, but once Tausret gets the ball rolling, she is a power with a momentum that cannot be stopped. Lastly, we have Amun Mess. As Viceroy of Kush, he has sway over his Egyptian counterparts, as he starts already with a standing within the Egyptian courts. His unique structures symbolize his standing, as both a power over the Kushite people and as a man who recognizes gold's strength. The Kushite Delegate School may be looked down upon by Amun Mess's people, but it fosters growth in the workforce within the province, alongside increasing production, as well as improving diplomatic relations with non-Egyptian factions. The Hidden Rooms also provide a great boost in all resources, happiness, and even legitimacy to the throne, at a very heavy cost of gold. But this cost means little to Amun Mess considering he has access to the gold mine labor villages. The amount of gold produced by this structure is very high, and while influence may drop at the horrific reality of gold's manufacture, that's of no consequence when he can pay someone to look the other way. The lands of Egypt are vast. The Egyptians are masters of desert and surgical strike warfare. The units native to each region of Egypt bring their own strengths to conflict. If you wish to bring these units into your armies, you'll need to either branch out your conquest to these locations and take them by force, or foster diplomacy, alliances, confederation, and vassalization. On the border of Canaan, you'll find the Sinai and Rep Genu militia. Their forces contain a mixture of both quite expendable units to hold lines or harass, and very valuable additions to bolster your damage output. Being on the border of Canaan, they do have many units in medium armor to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Canaanite forces, and some of their number also have decent armor piercing and breaking capabilities. In Lower Egypt, there's a decent mix of melee and ranged units to be found. This mix, however, does come at a bit of a cost, as they are not what you would particularly consider to be fine or noteworthy. They aren't a write-off, however, as many in their number have resistance to heat, and while they may lack skill, they do make up for this in number, perfect for any would-be warrior pharaohs wanting strength in overwhelming numbers. In contrast, the forces of Upper Egypt are a potentially very powerful addition to your defensive garrisons. Many Upper Egyptian melee units utilize medium armor, with the occasional light armored units to harass and provoke any enemy unwise to stand against them. This doesn't mean they're a slouch when it comes to offense, however. Like the rest of the Egyptian forces, they do have speed on their side, and they're exceptionally capable flankers, meaning they're able to deal big damage while holding out against any attackers of their own. In the deserts to the west lie the Libu tribesmen and the West Desert natives. The Libu tribesmen forces are unparalleled desert warriors, fighting on sand as though it were mere ground. Resilient to the sweltering heat of high noon, they can march unharmed through attrition zones in the desert, and the blistering sandstorms that cross the dunes do little to affect their combat prowess. 
They are the masters of the deserts. And when war reaches through the land and the sandstorms roll in, you'd better pray to whoever you worship that they're on your side. And in the south of the map, you'll find the Nubian and Kushite forces. The Kushites and Nubians are primarily built around the strength of their archers. They have expendable units who can harass and keep enemies preoccupied, whilst archers with exceptional range rain down the arrows. The archers can also be defended with other units from this region, as there's decently skilled and armoured spearmen and clubmen amongst their ranks. And lastly, there are the Pharaoh Elite. When you take the crown, you'll have access to some of the best of the best. Highly disciplined fighters, adorned in medium armour. Having just one of these units amongst others can turn the tides of battle in your favour. It's not just the lands who bring units into play. Each leader comes with their own troops, unique to their army, playing to their strengths. But Ramesses' unique forces very much build upon his strengths as a leader. The Medje and Sheridan that make up Ramesses' forces may not have the numbers that other factions exhibit, but their status as elite warriors who can adapt to whatever situation is before them makes them a very formidable force. Fast and adept at flanking, many of his troops also have the underdog trait, meaning they thrive in fighting against multiple units at once, potentially outnumbered, but rarely outclassed. Ramesses' retinue are a balanced and highly capable force. The levy soldiers that make up Seti's unique forces combine well with how he prefers to wage war. The lower tier units that make up his unique retinue compensate for their lack of skill with enhanced numbers and, from a pragmatic view, the expendable trait. Seti's more elite troops won't rout, or potentially care upon seeing the lower tier units meet the jackals of Anubis. The more elite units in his personal militia are highly capable warriors, if a tad undisciplined. Many of them have the heedless charger trait, meaning they won't wait for orders to simply charge headlong into battle. Perhaps they seek to find glory in their leader's eyes, or maybe they're simply emulating an anger they've seen from him all too often. Tausret's forces truly showcase the devastating power of chariots. The speed and range of the chariots at her disposal mean they can cause a lot of damage to the enemy, whilst staying out of harm's way. That's not to imply that she only has chariots, however. Tausret's infantry offerings, such as the Steadfast Queen's Guard, have excellent defensive capabilities and the speed to get to where they're needed as soon as possible. As talented as the archers in Tausret's army are, very few can compare to the forces that Armin Mess's deep pockets can buy. The Kushite, Nubian, and Tarseti archers are among some of the most skilled and most feared in all of Egypt. With excellent range and devastating attacks, the archers Armin Mess can field are an immediate threat to any force. The melee units within his retinue, including the Kushite Royal Guard, also have a ferocious bite making Armin Mess's forces a terrifying sight indeed. We've covered the leaders you'll command and their motives, the armies they'll control, and the forces that await to join under their banners. There are dark days ahead. With the collapse of the Bronze Age on the horizon, how will you ensure that your people and your empire survive this apocalyptic event? With what we've covered in this video, we hope you're inspired to become a great pharaoh that history would be proud of. Are you ready to take on the mantle of pharaoh?